Greetings, traveler. Welcome to my channel. If you guys don't know, I made a video focused on this topic a little over a month ago, and it has come to my attention that a lot of it was ill-informed, as said by the comments declaring it so. So before we begin, I want to address some of the glaring mistakes I made brought up by you guys in case there's any need of clarification. Here's the timestamp if you want to skip straight to the video. First and foremost, in reference to the poor job of patching being done by the developers, I fail to acknowledge the pressure developers face in hostile work environments, and that sometimes as a result, they might not have the information or even the autonomy to make proper decisions when it comes to balancing. Definitely an error on my part, I should have been more considerate and honestly let Synapsis trigger because it's just common knowledge nowadays, which is sad if you think about it. I also got many repeating comments on how terrible my smash takes were, pretty much rendering that entire segment useless. Most of them were about my thoughts on Byleth being just an okay character that takes a lot of work to use right. Every comment said that I was wrong by means of showcasing many examples of Byleth's reward outweighing the risks. They also mentioned that a lot of the top players ranked him high as well, but for some reason, probably due to my suffering online, I wasn't convinced. To be frank, I'm still not convinced, but I am aware that I'm wrong, so I'm waving the white flag on this one. You guys also said that because of Steve and Sonic's stalling playstyles, my thoughts on Ultimate Structure makes no sense. I basically said that the speedy environment and how much it rewards gimping was detrimental to certain characters in the cast, which was why I used Byleth as an example. Only for the speedy part though. I definitely don't stand by my Byleth take, but I still kind of support the structure part. Of course Steve and Sonic stall, but there are many more characters in that roster that use the engine's attributes to win, with others being stunted by them. So my investment for this argument in particular still stands. As for the rest of it, yeah, I probably should have stayed out of the kitchen with that one. Now about Mercy, I now understand that her pick rate might be higher than the rest due to the player base being fans of her and her playstyle. Her usefulness being dialed down to her unique damage boosting ability being used on Sojourn, which the Blizzard devs themselves said had an effect, is what made me come to my conclusion. And in doing so, I underestimated the power of the community. And waifus. Finally, surprisingly enough, a commenter from the other side blessed us with their presence and made note of the holes in my strategy at the end. I focused solely on community feedback, pick rate, and personal experience, but the comment made me realize that it was not as black and white as I thought. Some people might like picking a vessel, but they don't necessarily win a lot. Their pick rate might be tied to how fun they are, rather than their practicality when it comes to winning. How does one manage counterpicks? What exactly defines skill in a vessel? Should a player get a win rate reward for playing a harder to master character? We look at things through win rate and pick rate, but what about pro play rate? Which of these do we listen to when they butt heads? As you can see, all of the subjects in my strategy converge and collide in some way, further muddying the strat altogether. They also mentioned that all of these different factors and variables could be what makes it easier not to invest in, or at least not as much, as doing otherwise would add to the already huge workload the devs deal with. It helped shed light on the situation, and it still surprises me that a person who's been in that line of work provided this information. I honestly didn't think it would reach that far. Upon review, my video was shaky at best. I thank you guys for helping me realize my shortcomings. Don't worry, the removal of that video was definitely a one-time thing. I understand that my content will have flaws, but the piece in question had way too many for my taste. As for what you're watching now, while I have kept some old elements, most of it takes place in my new stance on the conversation. I'm not going to use this as a means to wipe the slate clean or make up for my mistakes. I mostly use this as an opportunity to take another stab at this and see if I couldn't come out with a better conclusion. Luckily, I think I achieved that, but ultimately it's up to you guys to decide. Last but not least, I appreciate the 300 plus members that joined the Tempora Clan. I wish I could have made a better first impression, but I'm eternally grateful nonetheless. Hopefully I can give you a reason to enjoy your stay in our little community. With all of that out of the way, please sit back and relax as we get stuck into the world of balancing one last time. Once upon a time on a regular sunny night, I got a lot of work done and didn't have too much to do, so I thought to myself, let's play some Splatoon 3. I grinded out and ranked for a couple of hours, pushing as far as I can before the next split. Eventually, through all the disconnects and network errors, I finally made it to S rank. So to test out my new Medal of Valor, I squat up with and against who are rumored to be the top dogs. And something happened. I just started to lose interest. I was too busy looking to be the best. I wanted the most kills, the most points. I wanted to carry my team to victory. Why? To make a name for myself? To show them all that I'm capable of being here? No matter the reason, I was on a downward spiral, losing my mind over the smallest things. Even with the wins, it'd feel like another complaint fest. So then I thought, yep, that's enough rank for the day. But I still want to play this game. Might as well switch over to Salmon Run. 
As I squatted up with these squids and accomplished a couple missions, I start to notice that my rank is going up, and if it goes up too far it'll be close to impossible to win, yet I can't change my rank unless I leave my group. I've already won with them a couple of times, they're rather communicative, and they always stick together, so I tough it out. The egg quota is on the rise and the bosses are fiercer than ever. We'd lose a match or two, but even in our lowest points we stuck it out to rise again. Then, the Kohozuna steps onto the scene. This is what real salmon runners are made of. I've only been able to beat it twice, but neither were when the tide was middle ground. We barely scraped through the last three waves, but something told me that we were ready for this. The longest minute and 40 seconds of our lives, and we spent it frantically searching for whatever boss we can take down. Egg after egg, the bar lowered. Victory was within our grasp. The clock was winding down. The Salmonoids put out one more full frontal assault on our back line, leaving me to finish the job. The enemy retreats in shame, while we celebrate our hard-earned conquest for glory. Upon returning to the lobby, I sat back and I said to myself, Wow, that was... actually fun leading me to put most of my hours into the fishing grounds. Working towards a common goal and reaping the rewards may be the appeal, but the hardships and trials that I endured with the players on that team is what made it all that much more worth it. Great tidings, friends. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you this story. Don't worry, it'll make sense by the end of this video. But before we get to that, let me ask you a quick question. If you could instantly fix one problem with the gaming industry, what would be the first thing that pops up in your head? The prices are rising, the quality is plummeting, unfinished releases would become the norm, and microtransactions are nothing but a red flag for the calamity that's to come. But it's only cosme- Whether it's a full price whole filled bucket or a free to play cash grab blunder, it's not difficult for anyone to acknowledge the day by day lowering of the standards of what we consider nowadays to be a quality piece of hardware. While there are some entries that stand above the test of time by rectifying these mistakes to craft gems adored by all, those gems are few and far in between. However, I didn't come here to discuss the current gaming climate, at least not as a whole. I came to talk about the one thing developers just cannot seem to get right no matter how hard, or little, they try. We're in the new age of portable home consoles and photorealistic graphics and yet this monster has still proven itself to be a daunting challenge in the realm of AAA gaming. And that challenge, my friend, is the art of balance. It's been too long since we've gotten an online PvP game with developers that know how to balance their genre system and their vessels for carrying out said system, whether it be characters, guns, moves, or abilities, in a way where the game can be enjoyable for most fans no matter the choice. Of course there's no perfect way to balance a game, but it's most certainly not in the way these guys are doing it now, which is the weak vessels stay weak and broken vessels stay broken tactic. At least until the companies are pestered long enough to make the weak vessels untouchable and the broken vessels unplayable, pretty much putting us back at square one. So what's causing this? Why is this such an incredible task for workforces housing billions of dollars and thousands of employees? Well, there are plenty of factors that can influence this. From illogical logic to just plain stupidity, let's take a nosedive into how balancing has been handled in the past years, find the culprit for this prickly predicament, and list some ideas on how to correct it. Okay, how do I start this? There used to be a time in the distant past where infinites, godlike frame data, glitches, and unnecessary difficulty spikes were something we just had to deal with. Well, not anymore, because in the day of internet connections and broken dreams, updates and patches have come to our aid. And it's still pretty much the same. But hey, at least the graphics look realistic. In terms of modern gaming, balancing has been misused in some of the most mind-boggling ways possible. Sure, you get the occasional bug fix and content addition, some more bare bones than others, but the most important parts are the changes to the game's system and vessels, some more bare bones than others. Even if the notes are entire articles, it's either at the end of the game's lifespan or they do nothing at all. And it doesn't help that companies adopted the change the game only when the game is changed tactic because certain vessels would be completely game breaking and nothing would be done about it until the next big content drop. Which is an all around god awful idea because players would have to decide to either take it or dish it for a period of months. Or if you've played Need for Speed, you had to decide to either take it or dish it for seven years. And even when they do deal with it, they triple down on it. They make sure that it is their top priority to end the reign of this top tier terror. And in doing so, they too get tossed down the list with the rest of the forgotten about low tier rejects. One of the common occurrences where a broken vessel was made weak, but the weak staying weak, and the strong staying strong. 
They slayed the dragon, but they forgot about the village that's still on fire. And that's it. There goes the chance for change for the time being until they feel like putting out more product again. I'm not done though. Let's talk about the times they actually tend to the burning village. In this case, the values of the changes are usually in small, very minuscule margins that only change certain situations and or interactions to make playing with or against the changed vessel a little less insufferable. Almost every game does this and it's still perplexing me to this day. I have no idea when this wave began to rise, but the one game that came to mind for me is Clash Royale. I'm gonna try and keep this as short as possible because I have way too much to say about this pickpocketing carcinogen created by sub L, but the balance changes for a bit used to be something to really look forward to. The meta was constantly changing for every update and surprisingly enough, it was a good thing. It wasn't schizophrenic because all decks and most cards had strengths and weaknesses. Sure, you had your log bait, rocket spam, expo, motorcycles, and we need some backup. Not to mention the beyond oppressive pay to win environment, but for the most part, they weren't always the foolproof go to decks like they are now. Even against the cheapest of decks, if you outsmarted your opponent, a golem deck would still be king. The main reason why Clash Royale held me for so long was because it was always a new experience. I was constantly learning and changing my game plan for whatever decks were in at the time, and it was encouraged because with enough time, dedication, and knowledge, I too could become a part of the Legend Trophy crew. That is, until King's Cup 2. Once Surgical Goblin barreled his way to victory, the game was never the same. Rinse cycles were in, and heavy soaks were out. As the values got smaller and the dev explanations got longer, or for these goons, inconsistent, we have three main goals when doing monthly balance changes. We want to make sure that every card is viable in at least one successful deck. We want as many viable successful decks in the metagame at a single time as possible, but we don't want any one deck to dominate. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? The meta turned static. Patch notes soon became doomed with menial shifts and microscopic margins. Now, if a card isn't good enough, Hey, we put their health up by a small percentage so that they die to one extra hit by this specific troop or spell. Or if we're on the other side of the spectrum, hey, we tone their damage down so it takes one more hit to get rid of this specific troop or take down a tower. They're receiving 6% damage reduction. This will affect goblins, goblin gang, and the goblin barrel. Not much will change with the regular goblins versus troops. It'll take like one extra stab to kill musketeers, ewes, giants, and pretty much half of the units in the game, but it's not really noticeable considering there are three of them. Or if we want to get schmancy, hey, we're buffing this troop's vitality by nerfing this spell's damage so that they can survive it with one HP, which in turn also takes down the usefulness of the spell at the same time. Double whammy! Now if a massive amount of the community, in this case we're talking over 90%, complain about the same problem, on some rare occasions they do implement a big change here and there. It's usually a rework, but other times they adjust the sliders accordingly. The only problem is, they don't work. Case in point. The Royal Giant has been a safe pick for anywhere on the leaderboard since the dawn of time. No matter how much damage they nerfed, or how squishy they made him, nothing beats a common card that can deal massive damage to buildings and only buildings at range at 6 elixir. Even the free to players <laughs> rejoiced at that sight. Something had to be done. Something has to change. So let's take serious account into nerfing his range. Make it so that he has to get really close to towers. That way it's easier to aggro him with buildings. But let's not stop there. He'll just be casted out for his point blank cousin if he's so easy to counter. So for a consolation prize, let's give him a bit of leeway so that he can be a good pick for certain decks and playstyles instead of every single one of them. Okay, okay, sounds like a plan. Maybe we could do something about his attack speed? Or take his elixir cost down to 5? What if we toss in a bit more movement speed for good measure? Let's buff his damage by 60%. What? America was outraged. Thus, the Royal Giant stayed on course to be a candidate for most used win conditions and nothing was achieved. This is what I believe changed the course for how developers see balance changing today. Small valued shifts for specific interactions that changes very little, only to be pestered into finally dedicating time for modifications that were way past due, just to overindulge and botch the job again. Of course, I'm sure that there are plenty of other examples predating it, but I chose it because 1. It was a huge game with massive success, and 2. It also brings to light one factor that plays a huge part in the potency of patch notes. One I'm sure most of you know of quite fondly. So let's dig a little deeper, shall we? At its birth, Clash Royale was at the top of my list, bringing about a gold mine of addictive gameplay with so much more in terms of aptitude just waiting to be unearthed. 
but then the esports wave flooded the industry, pushing executives to push developers to craft boats with nets in hand, ready to take advantage and scoop up whatever treasure they get their hands on, leaving the game to be thoroughly ruined in less than a year. Hold on now, was it solely to the fault of the pro scene affecting the balance changes themselves? While I think it'd be a bit ignorant to say that it was the only reason, <clears throat> the content world started to dry out and the oppressive pay to win environment didn't help much in that department either. So of course it isn't the only reason, but it can be the biggest. The content well definitely dried out, there's no denying that, but it wasn't because the updates stopped. Even after their four month break, they stayed pretty consistent with their patching. The problem mostly lied in the weight of the content itself, which was mostly empty. The main reason for the drought was because they cater to the top players that can afford max level cards, which consists of clash tubers and, you guessed it, esports players. They even admit that the top arena is where they base their balancing in their own video. We have chosen to focus our balancing decisions on challenges and maxed out ladder, where all cards are an equal level and we can get a fair judgment about cards when they're playing against each other, you know, equally. I'm calling bullshit. We of course taken feedback from the various social media channels, play a ton of games ourselves, and pay attention to all the Clash Royale esports that are happening around the world. Both the content drought and pay to win environments circle right back around to the same place, esports. Again, not the only reason. But it is alarming how whenever a game decides to go pro, it either dies irrelevant or lives long enough to become infamous. This is also another reason why I think balancing lost its way. Yes, esports has done a lot to entertain communities, and it's also helped a lot of players get to a place where they're financially stable from doing the thing that they love. I'm not going to deny the good things esports can bring, but I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that it definitely ran its course. It's what's further influencing companies to work on making the game fair for competitive play, moreover than fun for the fans, leaving a vocal minority to fend for themselves. But the game could be fun because of how fair it is. So then comes the question, are fair and fun mutually exclusive? This is where I think a bit of nuance is due. People are different. No two people are the same. They could be 99% alike, but that last 1% could be what makes only one of them play your game. So I think it's safe to say that pleasing everyone pleases no one. Although, I do think it's possible to try to appeal to both sides. The way I see it, I think that all PvP games should work towards being fun in their own way, with the fair part being secondary. For example, Mario Kart is both famous and infamous for its RNG and items. It's never a good feeling when you hear the jet engine powering the blue shell, or if a track hazard ruins your streak, or if you lose the final lap seconds from the finish line because someone got the opportunity to use a shroom cut, but no one is ever going to sit down and say that Mario Kart's items need nerfing, or that we need more control of the RNG aspects of the game, or that all tracks should be tournament legal. Why? Because the randomness is Mario Kart's charm. It's what drives people to play it. No matter how mad they get, they're always going to gear up for another race, because the playing field is always level. Not one person is exempt from MK's wrath. Whatever happened to you can happen to the people that caused what happened to you. It is the epitome of sweet revenge. This seemingly innocent kart racer starring Mario characters brings out the villain in even the most patient of players. A fun, vicious time among friends. And as a bonus, there's always the option to turn off the items for a more fair, competitive space. It was never the focus, but the choice is there. To further hit this point home, there's one comment in particular that stuck with me from my last endeavor on this topic. What if the character that sucks competitively makes sense casually? I honestly can't believe that I didn't think of this because it makes so much sense. If you've played Little Mac against an opponent in a fair environment, 9 times out of 10, Little Mac is going to lose because fundamentally speaking, he is an abhorrently created character. He's a fast glass cannon, but the glass switches to styrofoam the moment his feet leaves the ground. However, if we turn the tables and place him in a casual space where there's hammers, jetpacks, and bombs, he's close to unbeatable. His speed, his super armor, his KO potential, all combined with his brain dead moveset and counter, you don't have to do much to win. Now that I think about it, it's almost like it is fair, albeit a casual way goes back to my Splatoon story at the top of this video. In Ranked, I'd complain about how strong the Crab Tank is or how Gauss can kill from long range in two shots. In fact, think back to the Splashdown or the Kraken. In retrospect, Splatoon doesn't really have much to write home about in terms of balancing. But if you take those weapons into Salmon Run, you're nothing but grateful for how strong they are. Because those Salmonoids are unforgiving, disrespectful, cold, and calculating pieces of fried bits. And I would like nothing more than to see a Crab Tank reduce them to atoms. Am I saying that most PvP games should invest in PvE modes? Well, I'm going off the rails a bit. So to get off of this part of the discussion before I go on for too long, let's touch on a more recent example, as I have one more instance to support my point. Think back to Overwatch in 2016. 
Junkrat's Tire, May's Gun, Roadhog's Hook, and Mercy's Res are some of the many strong abilities that put Overwatch and their characters on the map. Back then, me and my brother would binge watch whatever we could because we were so fascinated with the diverse cast and their abilities. I mean, come on, you can't tell me that you weren't excited when you saw Tracer zipping around. Most of the cast had their ways of eliminating and supporting their opponents. Whether it worked or not, it was their way. This is what made me fall in love with the game when I finally got my chance to play it in 2019. Granted, I didn't get too much time outside of main tank because being a tank main that I actually wanted to win was an instant ticket to boredom, but the times I got to play D.Va, Zarya, even Winston, I always had a blast, even when a loss was on the horizon, because they were all so much more than plopping down a shield and hoping everybody would stick together. While I hated being main tank fodder, I completely understood why players insta-queued off tanks. They didn't care about winning for the most part, they just wanted to have fun playing the game that they love. It was why DPS was one of the most annoying roles to queue. Everyone wanted a piece of the action, which is kind of at the fault of the developers because the only time you could have fun with the other archetypes is if you played the half or off counterparts. Although the main healer role was a bit more on the fun side because it wasn't plopping down a shield and hoping people would stick together, aside from the constant badgering from that one teammate that can never stop themselves from dashing into a losing fight at 1 HP, running around and healing your team definitely beats the alternative. Then we go to the Overwatch Alpha. This is the most fair the game has ever been, yet nobody was impressed. Everyone felt weak and mundane. But it wasn't because the damage was nerfed, or the health bars were bulked, it's because the cast started to lose their identities. Overwatch soon became a gun game rather than a hero shooter. Instead of fixing the main tank problem, they just removed the reason for them to exist. Which not only made the game much more steamroller heavy, but it also made the off tanks bigger than usual DPS heroes, rather than the damage absorbers that help protect and disrupt. Further hitting home the loss of identity the game has inflicted on their heroes. Only three tanks have a deployable shield used primarily to protect teammates. Orisa's got removed to make her more aggressive, and it made her one of the strongest characters in the game. Did this make her fun to play? Yes. Unfortunately, it's at the expense of the other players. Killing her is difficult because she's highly durable, and she won't hesitate to swiftly end you in a quick spear combo, or god forbid, she catches you off guard with her ultimate. Instead of leading the team, the tanks quite literally take all matters into their own hands. All they need is a pocket healer, and they're pretty much good for the rest of the match. There's no need to master roles, utilize hero team synergy, or look for creative ways to win the fight anymore. It's just a whoever can shoot the most fast until the objectives are taken. The game lost the charm that gave it the prevalence it established seven years ago. All for the sake of being tournament ready. I'm sure the blow would have softened if they put out the PvE mode like they promised, but hey, what you gonna do? Many other games and franchises, past and present, have fell victim to the shaky market of esports even if the attribute that bolstered gaming or that one game specifically itself had to be sacrificed. Looking at all of this, you might be thinking that this is the part where I start to look for solutions to make balancing better, right? Well, to answer your thought, I have a proposition. Hear me out here. Instead of asking, how can we fix it, we should be asking, do we even need it? If the game is fun, why would we need it to be fair? Let's be real here. Balancing is tough. Old school tough. Can it be done successfully? Yes, there are cases where it has worked out. But the question remains, if the game is fun, why would we need it to be fair? Why go through all that extra work to change your vessels when that time can be used for more gameplay elements, more content, attention to detail? If it's fun, the job is done. Only thing you have to do now is make it more fun, with the fair competitive part being an added option. Don't get the wrong idea though, you can't just go crazy with the sliders, letting your vessels finish the job in one button and throw it out there to be released to the public, and you can't chalk it all up to RNG either. I can't define fun for everyone, but I know damn well that if every hero in Overwatch had the ability to one-shot opponents' bodies with their weapons but only 50% of the time, it would be nothing but frustration from both sides. If the game doesn't have a challenge, there's barely any input from the player. If there's no input from the player, what's the point? No matter how casual your game is, there always has to be a sense of challenge to give the player a reason to, well, play. Now, if you want your game to be fun because it's balanced in the competitive sense, then more power to you. In fact, I commend you for going on such a perilous journey. All I ask is that you be wary. Balancing is a slippery slope and it can get out of hand from as little as one move. Focus the uniqueness of your game on how fun it could be. What defines the aspect of fun for your game, that's for you to decide. But make sure that you do your due diligence and fuel the fire with passion. Do your research, experiment, and give the community a taste test. Balancing as a whole requires attacks from any and every angle. The game won't be perfect, and that's okay. Just do your best to stay aligned with what makes your game stand out. 
Stay away from esports and keep a close ear to the audience. No matter the climate, no matter the genre, whether it tests your skills or lives to entertain, with hard work, dedication, and pretty much just common sense, you can and will be able to endure the hardships and trials of the gaming industry, giving you the all clear to reap the benefits of whatever you choose to sow. Thank you guys for watching, and have a spectacular rest of your day. You, have, you live in two worlds here. Happiness is pleasure, and happiness is joy. You know, it can be either one. Pleasure is short-lived, uh, it lasts an hour, lasts a minute, lasts a month. It uh, peaks and then goes down, it peaks very high. But the next time you want to get that same peak, you have to do it twice as much. You know, it's like drugs. You, know, just, you have to keep doing it because it insulates itself. On the other hand is joy. And joy is a thing that doesn't go as high as pleasure in terms of your emotional reaction. But it stays with you. Joy uh, is something you can recall. Pleasure you can't. The secret is that even though it's not as intense as the pleasure, the joy will last you a lot longer. You'll never relive the moment you got your first car. That's it. That's the highest peak. Yes, you can get three Ferraris and a Gulfstream jet, and maybe you'll get close. But you have to keep going, and eventually you run out. I mean, you just can't do it. It doesn't work. So if you're trying to sustain that level of peak pleasure, you're doomed. Thank you.